last week at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California, scientists at the National Ignition Facility achieved fusion ignition. And that is creating more energy from fusion reactions than the energy used to start the process. It's the first time it has ever been done in a laboratory, anywhere in the world. A huge announcement today in the decades-long effort to harness energy. nuclear fusion. A huge breakthrough in producing an endless supply of clean, the cheap power. Are calling the holy grail of clean energy. The power of the sun is also an inside a land of marvel. Zero greenhouse gas emissions. Radioactive waste. It could power entire cities. Side to say towards clean energy. A limitless source Abundant. of clean energy. Unlimited clean zero energy carbon for power all of us. It's a giant step towards a clean energy future fusion, without dependence on fossil fuels forever. Does this mean that your local power plant's going to be operating with fusion energy in the next year? No. Does it mean that we've proven that fusion can take place on Earth? Absolutely. I have with me today Dr. Michael Bindebauer, the CEO of TAE Technologies. He's a physicist, a fusion expert, and he knows what it's going to take to get to commercial fusion. We talk about what this event means and what stands between us and delivering a commercial fusion power plant, the pros and cons to the different approaches and how TAE is taking a road less traveled. I'm Jim McNeil, and this is Good Clean Energy, a podcast where we discuss all of the steps that we have to go through to achieve a future of good, clean, carbon-free energy. Welcome, Michael. It's good to have you here. Thank you, Jim. Pleasure to be here. Uh, this has been such an exciting week in the fusion industry. What happened at the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore Labs. Can you put that in context, kind of the history of fusion and what it means today? Sure, yeah. This is basically a high point in this, what is it, 70 years that we're chasing terrestrial fusion, something like that. You know, this has been the aspirational goal, the first goal, frankly. It's not the power plant yet, right? To get to sort of make more energy than what it consumes. And it's kind of the differentiator between what's sort of theoretically plausible and most people in the field, of course, believe firmly, so they dedicated their careers to it, to sort of now have the proof in the pudding, right? It's that uh, definitive demonstration. Yes, it can be done terrestrially. It doesn't just work in stars. You can actually do it here on the ground. They were able to take what is essentially like a peppercorn size pellet of deuterium and tritium and excite it using x-rays generated by a laser. And I think it was 192 lasers in what, a billionth of a second. And when those x-rays excited that pellet, what happened? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's a massive installation. It's football fields in size. If you ever get to visit it, I highly recommend it. It is a eye-opening thing of human ingenuity, you know, creativity, engineering, all this stuff. So yeah, so the lasers, they basically all impinge on this super tiny target inside of what we call a hole around, which is like the cylindrical cavity that they shine into and that creates the x-rays that then impinge onto this, as you said, peppercorn sized target. And then what happens there is basically the energy that deposits on the surface of the target vaporizes that material and that material explodes out. It moves outward from the surface and by we call conservation of momentum, basically the rest of the material has to collapse and that leads to an implosion. And that implosion ultimately gets to a point where the density of this material compresses so much that it goes about to the density or beyond the density actually of lead or dense metals. Mm. And at that stage you reach higher temperatures and this very dense packing and at that point, you reach beginnings of fusion and then this early kernel of fusion occurring then heats the rest of the pellet up. We call that ignition. That's when the energy in one part of this tiny little amount of material is sufficient to then propagate that and then the entire little pebble burns up basically and converts the deuterium and tritium into helium and also, of course, neutrons. And then those neutrons fly out and those are the signatures they measure. They measure the, the energy contained in that flux that comes out. And that was bigger in the end than the amount of laser light that uh, they send into the cavity. And of course, we have to be careful here because we in the field understand this deeply. That for a layperson, it's important to appreciate that 
this isn't quite net energy in terms of if you look at a grid and how much energy went in the facility and then convert it to the laser light and all that, we're not at break even yet, but we call this scientific break even. And this has always been the academic first step. You've got to get to that, which is the light, the energy in the light that hits this plasma that's formed, that that energy is smaller than the amount of energy that does eventually emerge from that little paper corn burning up. Yeah. So when you go down the commercial fusion path, you're going to be held to a very different standard, which is a commercial queue, which is all the energy that you consume to operate your reactor versus the energy that that fusion reaction produces, right? Yeah, it's actually even more tight than that. Yes, it is correct. It's certainly that. But it's also then, remember, the energy that comes out here is in the form of mostly the neutrons, right? I mean, when tritium burns up with deuterium, you get copious amounts of neutrons. That's where most of the energy goes. And the rest goes into these fast-moving helium particles. But that's the lesser amount. So now you have to do something useful with that. You have to get it into electrical energy, right? And so you have a second step, if you will. The envisioned solution there is that somewhere this energy that is in the form of fast-moving particles, we call this kinetic energy in physics, converts to thermal energy. And that thermal energy then gets converted into electrical. And that goes through something we're all probably somewhere familiar with, right? The idea that we make steam and the steam eventually drives a turbine and the turbine drives a generator and the generator cranks and then come electrons. So there's inefficiency in that as well, right? So if you're looking at the overall what's needed, yes, you've got to include in your accounting all the energy from the grid throughout the facility, then the production coming out of the burning plasma core, and then converting that mostly kinetic energy into electric energy eventually. And then hopefully there you have more than what you initially fed from the grid and that extra will go out to the world. So Michael, this was inertial confinement fusion. And so this is a pulse of a laser into a target, which is very different than magnetic confinement, which is a steady state process. You want to walk us through what the difference are between those two approaches? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, what they did at the National Ignition Facility was essentially a little micro bomb going off, right? If you were to try to turn that into a power plant, what you would need to do is you would have to have you know, succession of those micro bombs at the right rate to get an average energy out of the system. And in the case of the National Ignition Facility, or at least in the design work off that, they're thinking maybe they would need to fire this 10 times a second. There's other sort of intermediate pulse systems they think they may have to fire once a second, but it's a high repetition rate. Now, what we're doing, on the other hand, is in steady state magnetic confinement fusion. And as the name implies, steady state, there isn't any one-time event and then a break. It continuously produces, right? So you essentially are heating up a plasma core and then a plasma core begins to fuse or in the core fusion starts to occur. And then you get energy out and you're continuously fusing and you're feeding new particles in where some are burning up. And so there's a continuous loop that provides energy uh, without any intermittency. In things like the National Ignition Facility and these pulse concepts, there's a break, right? It's more like maybe uh, the engine in the car, right? Where each cylinder fires in a certain interval and then you get an average energy out to drive the car. Uh, this is the idea in these national ignition facility-like machines, whereas in, in TAE's case, we're looking to really run steady state. Well, if you think about it, the magnetic confinement in steady state plasma is a lot more like the sun, except for the sun has the gravity and all of its mass to hold that big ball of gas together we have a cage of a magnetic field which is, surrounds the plasma. And so it's just that ball of plasma that we keep feeding and spinning and rotating. And that's when all the fusion takes place, right? In the side of that cloud. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's actually a great analogy. I had never thought of it like this. I like that. <laughs> the idea that the sun is, yeah, it doesn't flicker. Right? I mean, luckily for us, yeah. it's constant on. It's constant. And burns and burns and burns. And of course, there's so much mass there that, you know, it'll take billions of years before it burns out. And, and that same amount of mass is what holds it together, right? That's how you get the gravity you alluded to. And of course, that makes the whole thing work quite differently. You know, in the sun, the temperatures are actually lower than what we need in terrestrial fusion. Yeah, for benchmarks, the core of the sun is about 15 million degrees. Terrestrially, we're looking at things in the 100 million to a billion degrees. So it's quite, quite hotter. But the sun is much denser packed. The particles get compressed enormously by this humongous gravitational field. And of course, terrestrially, we can't do that. And as you said, that's where we have to find other tricks. We use lasers like they did at the National Ignition Facility. 
In the case of TAE, we use magnetic fields, right? And we try to put some pressure on, but it's a bit gentler. And with that, you don't get that same packing. And so we have to make up, because fusion is a product of both density and temperature, right? We have to make up with higher temperature, therefore. And so that's why terrestrial fusion is a bit different in terms of its regime, but it's the same process. You're taking the light elements, you bang them hard, and you get heavier elements, and you get a lot of energy in the process. Well, considering the sun has about a million times the mass of the Earth, there's no way we're going to get the kind of gravitational force you get from a sun. So you have to make up for it with heat, right? Yep. And that's why we have to get to temperatures of 100 million to 150 million C for deuterium and tritium, and we have to get to a billion degrees for boron. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about neutronic fusion versus aneutronic. This was a DT event, correct? Yes, this was. And of course, you know, if you look, as you just said, the stepping stone, the ladder to the higher temperatures, DT is sort of your first step on the ladder. That's when you get to leave your baby shoes behind and you've taken your first step. So that, that's at the 100 million, 150 million degree mark. That's where tritium, deuterium tritium burns. And that's what the NIF or the National Ignition Facility has done. Uh, that's what pretty much everybody in fusion is aspiring to as the first step. And even in the case of TAE, while this isn't our first step, and we'll talk about what we're going to do in a second, but it's also a step on the way. You have to get through that temperature regime. And so, you know, you, you can put a checkbox there. And then eventually, if you can do beyond, then you get to the exciting part, which is what we call the aneutronic fuels. Now, what does that mean, right? So those are fuels where there are no neutrons produced. Like I said a little while ago, the deuterium tritium fusing, as in the case of the National Ignition Facility, produces neutrons. And those who have been in the nuclear world or have read about it will know that neutrons are sort of a bit a nasty thing. They, they cause uh, radioactivity, they cause radioactivation and radioactive decay. And so if you make neutrons, you have an impact on material. And, you know, listeners can think of this as like little billiard balls or maybe little machine gun pellets hitting the surface say, of a reactor. And if you have enough impacts from these small bullets or projectiles, you eventually really destroy the integrity of material. My PhD mentor, Norman Rostock, used to always say these are, it's like turning things to powder. And so neutrons are a big deal. And, you know, if you can avoid them, you want to. But as we just said, the temperature required to go beyond things that produce neutrons is really difficult. And once you can do that, though, then, then you will get to what we call a neutronic. So, Michael, from the very beginning, even back when you joined TAE, I think a mission of the company was to think about the end in mind, the end being achieving commercial fusion, a machine that is not just environmentally sound and intelligent, but also economically viable. And is that what's really driven the mission to go down the aneutronic path and to use boron instead of deuterium and tritium? A hundred percent. I have to admit here immediately that credit goes to Norman, right? When um, I joined as a student, completely naive. I mean, I had no idea about any of these concepts, frankly. I knew what fusion was to a degree and I had one course that actually I took from him as an undergraduate in plasma physics. But the notion was right there that one had to find a more practical and what that all implies, meaning economic and, you know, from a maintenance perspective and in every sense, something that fits the industrial setting of a utility. And fusion at least is practiced in most laboratories in the world, government and to a degree private. Certainly back then did not meet any of those criteria, frankly. And one can't really criticize for that. It was really the idea of first small steps for small feet, right? You got to get to net energy, like we just said. And Norman deserves a lot of credit because he went bolder and in a way demanded more of the program or more of the, of the goals set. And when I started, he said, look, if we really want to make this an applied end product, I mean, a power plant, then we got to look beyond deuterium and tritium. And that eventually led to becoming convinced that hydrogen and boron is something that's doable, which by the way, you know, in those days, a lot of people, and even today, probably doubt that that can be reached because, you know, it's about a factor of 10 higher in energetics than where you need to go for tritium. But we set that as the goal and it defined pretty much everything else from there. So you can certainly say TAE was started in the concept before, when TAE started in 1998, right? But when we were working at the university, it was about 1990 when we began working on this. It was all born out of the idea that we had to engineer and design and create something 
that meets up with the end in mind requirement, which is economic, clean power from fusion and practical and all those other things. Well, you know, Norman was quite the renegade when you think about it, right? I mean, because everyone in the industry has been kind of revolving around the Russian donut or the tokamak. And from the beginning of TAE, it's always been the field refers configuration model, which is remains today. Although you've learned a lot in building reactors and testing and building plasma, but it's essentially his vision from the beginning, isn't it? Oh, hundred percent. I mean, I think the remarkable thing is when you unpack it a little bit further back in his career, he worked on a lot of the standard things in the field. I always say this, and this is no joke, you can't get a PhD in this field without suffering you know, through a lot of the stuff that he discovered. You have to grasp those concepts that he discovered and published and you know, researched. And so he was a, as much a, a standard bearer and a founder, if you will, of the field. I, I would think there's probably, I've never counted them, but I would probably see some small club of what I call the popes of the field, right? These guys founded the entire construct of plasma physics and then derived from the physical laws to the engineering consequences and then how you would maybe make something that looks like a power plant. All of this all the way back to the 50s, right? And so he was embedded in the thick of it. He won the Maxwell Prize, which was uh, still is the award to, to win from the American Physical Society for work in plasma physics and fusion. I suppose we may see a Nobel Prize one day. Maybe the, the NIF make it one, who knows, but you know, we'll see. But up to now, the biggest prize is that. And Norman won that. So he won the accolades and the claim of his peers. And then he had the guts to say, you know, that's all great. But are we really serving the end product goal that we should set ourselves? I mean, are we doing textbook science? That's fine. But if that's what it is, then we can work with Tritium. Machines that can potentially get there. But if we really want to make the difference and connect to the most practical, most economic, cleanest, most abundant form of fusion, then we have to go beyond. And that means perhaps thinking in a radically different technological and scientific direction. And for somebody that had such a stellar career and all the accolades and comfort, therefore, constantly challenging yourself to go deeper, further, and in a path less traveled, not a lot of people do that. He did. He did, yeah. And he took actually a lot of hits for that. I think everybody obviously revered him for what he did, in his earlier part of his career, in his later years, some people questioned. They're like, well, maybe he fell off the edge a little bit with this idea of, as you said, field reverse configurations and hydrogen boron and so on. And so when I came in, in fact, it felt like, like these little sticks swimming against the current. Well, you know, to be clear, to people who are listening to this for the first time, a tokamak is like a hollow donut or a hula hoop, if you will, and a FRC or a field reverse configuration reactor is if you cut that donut in the middle and made it stretch out straight and pinch the ends. So now you just have a hollow cylinder, which has a vacuum. And then you fill that with a gas and then you activate that gas by basically shooting, what, hundreds of thousands of watts of electricity into it, right? And then it gets contained by this magnetic cage, which are the magnets around it. And then what happens? You're, you're going to feed it and you're going to spin it, right? Its biggest difference, actually, is it makes most of its own magnetic field, right? So if we start there, in the world of magnetic confinement, most constructs and concepts people work on are defined by the geometry and the mainly for the geometry of the magnets, right? As you mentioned, the tokamaks, it's a donut-shaped device. It looks like a donut. There are multiple kinds of magnets that you need to affect that geometric topology and try to hold the field together. There's a high degree of complexity and the magnetic fields have to be very, very high and they're all applied from the outside. And plasma makes some, of course, makes some magnetic fields. You know, anytime you move electrical charges, you get a current and that current, of course, generates a magnetic field. So you have that. But in, in the FRC, what's remarkable is that, I mean, you need some outside magnetic field to sort of anchor this and give some level of pressurization. But a lot of it, and in fact, the, the predominant magnetic field actually gets generated by the currents in the plasma. We call this um, self-confined or a self-created magnetic field. It's a quite a different concept. And one of the handicaps, in fact, early on in that was that people thought it would be too unstable. You can appreciate if you're relying on internal processes to kind of align themselves nicely and create the current that you want so that the magnetic field is there, how stable can that be? How homogeneous? You know, I mean, can you control all these parameters? Is it going to remain where you want it and at the amplitude you want it? 
And frankly, to be honest, the early ex experiments didn't look too good. You know, FRCs were very unruly. In a way, they're sort of little children. You know, they, they're very energetic and they just break out of the cage and they hit the wall and the party is over. A good friend of mine and another Norman student, and he's our chief science officer, Toshi Tajima, he always likes, um, he's Japanese, he loves analogies. And he used to always say, if our seas are like, they're, they're more like human beings where the rigidity that gives us the ability to walk and stuff is from our skeleton, but it's on the inside. If you look at the world of insects, for instance, you know, as he says, there's the, the bugs, right? They have an exoskeleton, the skeleton on the outside and the soft stuff is on the inside. In a way that you could argue then, you know, tokamaks are sort of like these insects and, you know, we're more like sort of a, a mammal. And the consequences are our soft stuff on the outside is pretty fragile, right? But it's also very flexible. Mm -hmm. And as we grow, we don't have to constantly shed our exoskeleton. And so there's a lot of flexibility from it, but it brings internal dynamics. And the tokamaks, in that sense, they're more constrained. They're forced from the outside with the magnetic fields. And we have to make sure we maintain the insides coherently. And that took a lot of time. And now we, of course, are very stable. Those early problems are completely behind us. And Norman is not only indicated, but was absolutely right. Those things can be made very, very stable and very successfully get you up the ladder in performance towards the fusion regime. Well, I guess it's a bit like a spinning top, right? The faster you spin it, the more stable it gets, right? And you once told me that the interior stack of magnets that's inside of the Eater tokamak, that one of those magnets is strong enough to, to lift an aircraft carrier? Yeah, well, that's a good metric, right? That I've never calculated, to be honest, but uh, that, that's been in our community sort of a comparative to say, yeah, it's a serious magnet. It has serious forces that it has to sustain it's a wonder of engineering. And in fact, General Atomic is delivering these components to Eater right now, right? They're building them down here in San Diego, up on 50 miles south from where we are, TAE. And it is a massive engineering job, never before done in the scale that they did. And that's a remarkable accomplishment, but it also speaks to the complexity and the high cost of these, right? You contrast that, what we need, our magnets are more on the scale of an MRI machine or so, right? I mean, a little bit bigger than an MRI because we want to make a plasma that's about a meter in diameter, maybe a meter and a half. Humans are a little smaller when we go into an MRI machine, so the bore isn't that big, the tunnel in the middle. But the shape, the geometry, those are all very, very similar. And the field strength is not that off, that far off. Whereas in the tokamak, you need much, much higher field. And coming back to the other thing you mentioned about the spinning tops, that's a great analogy and I always like to use that to sort of explain why one can make things that seem unruly actually stable, right? We all play with tops when we're children and we explore on how they spin and they're very nicely standing there, top heavy, you know, in the gravitational field doing their spin. And then they start slowing down because the friction with the table starts to sort of break them a little bit and eventually you start to wobble and then they flip over, right? The electromagnetic analog is frankly an FRC and it wants to do that. And the thing that prevents it from doing that is what you mentioned, it's rotation, right? Another way to say it's gyroscopic effects. You play with a gyroscope and you remember you want to turn that a little bit. There's quite a bit of force that resists you. And right? we call this conservation of angular momentum that builds that sort of counter torque there. We use those kinds of principles actually exactly in the FRC and that's what eventually gives it stability and rigidity and the predictability that we need and repeatability so we can operate with it on a continuous basis. Right. Well, anyone who ever remembers learning how to ride a bicycle understands that it's much easier to ride a bike when you're going at speed than when you're going slowly, right? It's a much more That's right. stable device. Now, so we have less expensive magnetics because we let the plasma do a lot of the work in terms of creating a magnetic field as it gets more excited and, and gets hotter. So our, our cost for magnetics goes down. But then there's this whole difference between boron and deuterium and tritium, which is you don't have to deal with neutrons when you have a boron hydrogen event. Certainly not at the level that a DT machine does, right? As that's a big economic savings as well, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. The economic savings come essentially from two things, right? As you just said, the magnets that are lesser, and magnets are always a big expense in these machines. You know, it could be half the cost of the equipment, perhaps. It's a big impact point. So if you can make the magnets lesser, then you have a big savings there. And then we have, we didn't talk about this much, but because of the weight of the polygy is and that most of the fields carried on the inside by the plasma itself, there's a higher degree of efficiency. And the efficiency of this is what also brings a big economic benefit. And then you go to boron. 
that is obviously extremely additive to good economics because now, as, as we said earlier, it's aneutronic, right? So you do not end up having to worry about what happens with neutrons. You don't have a lot of equipment damage, therefore. You know, plant life is not limited by this plasma thing. It's limited by the normal things that plague anything humans built. And we estimate based on analysis of sort of the engineering components, we will get the same plant life that you will get with a gas turbine or, you know, any other generation technology of today. So that's economically a big difference than compared to, say, a tritium-based system where you will have to replace good chunks of the machine that are expensive and complex with robots, mind you, because it's radioactivated after some runtime, right? On a continuous basis, continuous meaning here like once a year or so. That only means um, you have to expend money and cost to replace parts, but the machine's also down. It's not going to make energy, right? And so those things are big drivers. And lastly, the other economic driver is fuel itself, the availability. You know, if you look at tritium today, we have about 50 kilograms or so in the world. That's not very much. You can almost fit that in a small suitcase. And that's all there is. And that actually is coming out of fission reactors, believe it or not. And these are many of the ones that are conducive to making more tritium than others. The Canadians have a, a, a good fleet of those and, and those are at the end of life. And so as those go away a lot of the free tritium in the world will reduce and it also decays if you don't constantly replenish it. So there is a big impact from scarcity, even on the, eventually on the level of experimentation. Not for now, there's plenty of tritium here to do these experiments, you need very little. Yeah. Uh, but eventually you start reactors at scale, there is. And then you come to the cost point, what is a scarce material like tritium cost, right? Last estimates I've ever looked at were somewhere in the thirty thousand dollars per gram. <laughs> yeah, but this is this is super expensive stuff, you know. The other thing we we talked about once before, which you pointed out to me, which is really interesting, is you don't need railroad rails or highways or pipelines to feed a boron plant. I mean, you could deliver the fuel for a year in the back of a pickup truck. Yeah, I mean, you know, in a way, that's probably true for all fuels. So many you have them and they're available and they don't, the radioactivity doesn't bother you. And the classified nature of tritium, I mean, is, you know, it's also used in some of our thermonuclear warheads. Boron doesn't have any of that problem, right? First of all, metric down mining. We live out here, in our facilities out here in California. In the deserts of California, there's actually a town called Boron, USA. It's in the middle of the Mojave Desert. They mine by the metric ton. Remember U.S. Borax, 20 mule team, the little boxes of detergent, right? That's exactly what we're talking about. And so this substance is in ubiquitous supply worldwide. There are very large deposits pretty much everywhere. There's no one concentration of it. So it's really nice from sort of an energy security or availability perspective. And then when you look at now back to your point about the, the power plants, yeah, it doesn't consume much. This is the other beautiful thing that's true for all of fusion, but particularly here, you need very little. When you take one fusion event, say you're fusing deuterium with tritium or you're fusing hydrogen with boron, it's in the order of a million to up to 10 million times more energy release than when you burn a molecule of gasoline. Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't take much to make a lot of energy is the point. And right. so when you look at the fact that ours is clean and non-radioactive and so on, you could definitely throw on the back of a pickup truck the fuel you need for a year's worth of operation of a machine that would make something like three, 400 megawatts of power, which is, you know, what you need right. for a smaller city or town. So absolutely. And this, when you sort of scale that into where we need to go, particularly the developing world where most of the demand's going to come from, that's fantastic, right? As you said, you don't need rail lines, you don't need pipelines. Maybe you use a helicopter, and if you can't, you could can't carry it in. <laughs> Joking here. So let's talk about, you know, some of the, the pitfalls of the fission industry. You know, we had our first fission plant operate in 1951 in Idaho. And it wasn't until the late 70s when we had 100 gigawatts of power online. So it's not exactly what I'd call a rapid, you know, adoption of modern energy technology. Exactly. But the point being is that Every fission plant that's built out there is built bespoke. It's built as a custom thing. And there's a lot of money that goes into shielding because obviously uranium and plutonium have half-lives of thousands of years in terms of radioactive waste. And there's also waste pools at these plants. We're not going to be approaching it this way. And I think it would be good for you to explain to people the difference between 
radiation is misunderstood. I mean, obviously, uranium and plutonium are highly radioactive. Tritium, much less so. It's going to have a much shorter life than uranium and plutonium. And then even though we're using boron and hydrogen, there is still a level of radiation. But as you explained to me once before, it's kind of like ambient radiation. Can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah, I think it's a very important subject, actually. I think hopefully this is something people can take away, right? Fusion and fission are sort of cousins, if you will. I mean, very odd cousins, perhaps, but they are in the taxonomy of things. They're both nuclear energy, but they're very, very different. So in the case of fission, of course, as you just said, uranium, plutonium, heavy elements are part of that game. And that means you have not just radioactivity while it runs, but you have a lot of waste material that has, we call this in physics, half-life, right? So it kind of describes the decay constant or gives you a sense for the time scale over which something is active, radioactive. And in those heavy things, some of them in particular, you have time scales that you measure on the order of 10,000 years. So it, it's, uh, you know, I've said this once before and I know people don't like that, but I, I think I stick by it because I think it's true. It's a little bit of a pact with the devil, right? I mean, once you sign up and you get this stuff, what are you going to do with it? You're a bit stuck with it. And 10,000 years, you know, I used to say this to people, you know, what was the oldest things we have ever built that we still have quality construction, maybe the pyramids or something? Yeah. You're looking like what, 5,000 years or so? Mm-hmm. You know, and so now you're up for something that's supposed to be there for 10,000 or more. And it's not just the structure. You have to cool this stuff inside because it, it radioactively decays. It generates heat, right? So you got to cool it. You got to monitor it. You don't want people to get to it. Can we have a government stable enough for 10,000 years to monitor the site? Not forget even the engineering and all that. Those are all big headaches. And this is why, of course, the fishing industry faces lots of problems. And this is just on the waste stream, right? Now contrast that to the waste stream on fusion. And it's remarkable because what we find there is, yeah, it's a bit radioactive it's, if it's tritium, if it's hydrogen boron, it's not radioactive while it runs. When it stops, worst case, you will have stuff that have short half-lives. You know, in our case, for instance, in hydrogen boron, it's never 100% clean, but it's almost clean. And the few things that you may have, they have like half-life like 50 days and it's not very reactive to begin with. It's more like a medical isotope facility, you know, the kind of things we find if you go into the nuclear medicine department of a hospital today and you do a PET scan, if you're an oncology patient or something, hopefully not, but if you were, then you have to get these scans done and they inject you with small amounts of radioactive medicine. And these are in every hospital and they generate sort of a small waste stream. And that's about the waste stream that we would find coming out of one of our plants. These hospitals sit in densely populated city centers Nobody worries about it because we don't have to. The safety there is, is not in question. So that's a wonderful attribute of all of fusion. And when you come to hydrogen boron fusion, it's just incredible. And the other part is when you now think about what could go wrong while it runs, well, then we think immediately when we think nuclear, right? We think Chernobyl, we think more recently Fukushima, those horrific accidents where, where then, you know, the core melts down in the fission plant and you get all this material come out and then you have to quarantine the area for decades and maybe longer and it turns into a wasteland so to speak fusion doesn't suffer that problem that's really important people appreciate right there is no meltdown possibility i always like to say what makes it so darn hard to do makes it incredibly safe you know what's at stake here right so we have to hold this super hot material together for long periods of time and if anything goes wrong and the hot stuff makes contact with its surroundings it cools off why does that happen? Because while we make things very hot, we heat up very few particles. And around it is all this dense, cool material like metals and so on that are room temperature. Right. So if those few hot things come in contact with many cold things, the heat transfers readily. And in fact, the cool stuff doesn't really get any warmer, but the hot stuff cools out and gets cool instantaneously. So it stops. So the point is fusion is a driven process. You have to constantly put energy in, you have to constantly massage it to keep it going. Fission, on the other hand, is a chain reaction process that once you start it, it self-propagates and it doesn't stop until everything is consumed. And in particular, if it starts to run away on you, then you get a meltdown. And in fusion, everything stops instantaneously. Now, I wish it wouldn't be quite as severe because then we would have fusion already because that's super hard, right? That's where the challenges are. But once you have it going, keeping it going is even harder. And so if anything goes wrong, it stops. And so there's inherent safety 
built in by nature. Yeah, what comes with that different radioactive profile, though, is really worth considering because you can see a future where you can build uh, proton boron reactors in a factory and ship them around the world and have them stood up and commissioned and operational in virtually any part of the world, like in the dense center of Delhi or in Singapore, because you don't have the same radioactive shielding considerations you'd have for a fission plant or even for a deuterium and tritium plant. So from a deployment standpoint, it could be really commoditized, I think, much more efficiently than fission ever hoped to be. That was exactly one of the key reasons we pivoted to hydrogen boron in the entire concept, right? It's precisely for those reasons. You can make something that is obvious, is then very practical, can change the way power gets made in the sense that you do it where the population center or where the consumption center is. It could be for industrial use, could be for you know residential use, whichever it is. But you put it where the end users are, where the load is. And if you look at it today, I mean, fission is one example where the, the plants are somewhere where, of course, nobody lives in case something goes wrong, right? But even look at the renewables, right? I mean, they don't typically, I mean, we have a little bit on our rooftops, but that doesn't sustain a city like New York or LA. You need much more power than that. And then you have to go out into the deserts of California, for instance, where you're in the Great Plains. And those areas are very sparsely populated. And then you have to bring that power to the, for instance, the US to the coastlands, right? So now you're facing long transmission lines. Those are not only expensive and they're kind of ugly and they you know, impact the environment, but they also are lossy. You lose a lot of the power. Now contrast that with something like fusion, that's high power density, very clean, no radioactivity to speak of if it's hydrogen boron. Yes, you can place those in the consumption center. You get rid of the long transmission lines. What you really end up having is a much more autonomous grid, decentralized, many smaller plants perhaps. And you don't have transmission in the utility anymore, really. You have mostly in the distribution, which you know they, that refers to sort of the last lake of things. From Normally you have transmission lines from the power plant to some distribution site that's near the city center, I mean, or in the, in the urban vicinity. And from there, they distribute it to all the little things like our homes and the industrial sites and so on. But with a more centralized plant, you don't need that. So you get a lot of better stability, you get more resilience in case something goes wrong, and you have more options basically, right? And yeah. so reliability in the end goes up and the costs are lower and you will have less losses. It's more efficient. I think this is absolutely the future. And if you look at, you know, urbanization and the trends we have where more and more people live in ever more denser centers, you will need sources of power like that. It's very hard to envision the mega cities of the future being run by low energy density fuel that has to be sort of shipped in, quote unquote, to long transmission lines from, from somewhere else. When, when you're thinking of reliability and, you know, us as end consumers, what do we, what do we expect? Every time we flip the switch, the light comes on. Right. right. If they ever send you a note on your email, I mean, on your text messaging, and it says, hey, we may have to take your circuit out, even for maintenance or something, and it happens once a year, you get very upset. Energy is so existential, electrical energy to our quality of life, survival. I think the fridge goes out for too long. Even if in there, it just goes south, right? These are all things that are sometimes maybe annoying, but sometimes really existential. So um, reliability is a huge deal. And again, this isn't trying to displace renewables or argue that they don't have a space to be part of it. They do. They're fantastic in that they're green. They're free of carbon emissions, right? And they're getting cheap. So they're, from a cost point, attractive. But they do have that one problem, right? I mean, they have two problems, really. They have the low energy density for one. And the other one is, of course, variability. And we're a bit at the, at the, at the mercy of Mother Nature, right? Of the weather. You get it when the sun shines and when the wind blows and you don't get it when those things are not on. And we now know, and we have enough weather data, for instance, in the US, and I have a friend who studies this at UC Irvine, where they can look at any county anywhere in the country and you know pull up the weather data for the last, like say, 50, 60 years. And you will find these periods where you know there's take Boston or something, and during those 50 years, there's a period of three weeks without any sunshine. Dense cloud cover. What are you going to do? You have solar there, right? It's not going not to help you. Can you build batteries that can store all that? That's one way, and it's very expensive, of course. And we don't even have the capability today to, to quite do that. Right. The other solution, of course, is you have backup power. I like to call this sort of shadow capacity. It's capacity that sits there that idles or doesn't even run, costs you a ton of capex and some opex to maintain for those few moments when you need it, right? That's economically not viable either. 
This is where Fusion slots in, becomes that reliable, available base load power. The utility sector calls this dispatchable, right? This is power you can always turn on and off when the humans want it. We control that, not nature, not the weather. It's clear now in all circles that we're going to need that. And if you look what's available today to service that part of the electric supply chain, well, it's either carbon-based things like, you know, gas turbines and so on, which we want to get rid of, or it's nuclear fission. Today, it's the only carbon-free one that can do this base load, right? And this is where fusion comes in. Once we have it, I think it and renewables will be the future of the grid at some point. You know, it'll be interesting when we have the final bill of materials and the cost of goods for a commercial nuclear power plant to compare what the material costs are for a 500 megawatt plant versus 500 megawatts of wind. You know, because a wind turbine takes about a ton of rare earth metals. And I think that when we get to that commercial level, we're going to find out that fusion's pretty darn cheap to operate. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, is it, you know, this is, of course, always going to be the battle on the statistics. Okay, are you talking about the first 10 plants? Are you talking about plant number 1000, right? There's a lot of things that will impact that. But you're absolutely right. First of all, rare earth materials and those kinds of scarce resources out of the ground that we need to build some of these infrastructures for motors and turbines and so forth. That's a big impact point. The scarcity of that will impact price negatively, right? It drives it up. It also leads to potentially more conflict. You know, it's not just energy in itself, but the tools to make the energy that can lead to conflict. So, you know, you think of some of these rare earths or in batteries, what do you need from lithium to cobalt and so on? All those things are impact points. And then, of course, you have the economies of scale where you build these things and deploy these things. And if you have systems that are more practical, that are more compact, that can be built with less complexity, that can be shipped at lower cost to sites, those are all going to be there to make a big, big impact. And, and then when you look at the uh, our opportunity with our fusion designs, these can be centrally manufactured. This is the vision, right? You, you have centralized facilities that will, at industrial scale, build these things, cookie cutter, if you will, and then you ship them out to sites and assemble, to final assembly there, of course, an installation. But this is very different, for instance, talking really about fission, and you said bespoke. It's a great way of saying that, right? Because these plants are all, in a way, monolithic one-up designs that don't find replication typically. The people that built them, the crews that do this, a lot of it is concrete and rebar. That's done site-specific ones with local tradespeople that do that. And they don't move on and build the next one, and the next one, and the next one. So they learn and they get more efficient at it. That just doesn't happen. Well, when you go centralized stuff, we know all the things we make cookie cutter, they do get cheaper. And so I have no, there's no question in my mind that there is a point of inflection where fusion has the potential not just to be clean and in control of in terms of from a reliability perspective, but can also really be in, in the most cost competitive spot on the generation assets of the future. Not plant one, but sufficient plants built and learning curves down, and we'll get to that. So going back to our original opening topic, which is what happened at the National Ignition Facility in California, this is a major breakthrough event because it proves that you can get net energy out of a fusion event. You know, where, where do we go from here? So we're, we're about to build Generation 6. This is a machine we call Copernicus. We hope to have that on and up and running somewhere around mid-decade, say 2025. So 25, let's say it starts to operate. Then we should very quickly get to a point where we can show, just like the NIF did, that the conditions are right to make net energy. And then the journey from there is pretty well defined. We have to build then one more upgrade to get to a power plant. Copernicus is a, still an experiment, right? We measure power in, we measure power out. We do some synthetic computer modeling on the what if, if we had all the conversion systems and we used the right fuel in it, and then what do you get, and so on. The next machine, though, then is a real, basically, prototypical power plant that will send electrons to the grid. We call that Da Vinci today. We think we will have that early operation somewhere around the end of the decade. So by 2030, we should be in a position where we can show not just net energy, but now net electrons to the grid. And that's sort of then the dawn of going to the first steps of commercializing. So I think by the early 2030s, our technology should be in a position to um, build out the first plants that then can connect and will connect to the grid. Well, it's an exciting path and it must be really satisfying for you. I mean, you've dedicated your entire career to fusion and to have this event take place where 
How many conversations have you been in before where people have said, well, this is not going to happen. You can't make fusion happen on earth. You know, there's just a whole bunch of naysayers and doubters out there. To a large degree, this may put some of that conversation to rest. It does. You know, I think it was just you and I had a talk the other day about Roger Bannister and breaking the four minute mile. Before that, people thought, gee, um, can human anatomy lend itself to running at that pace? Maybe not, right? Well, that doubt gets taken out now, right? And I think the naysayers or the doubters now have to take a step back and say, okay, you know, it made energy terrestrially is possible. And, and that's a huge boost, not just because it's probably going to bring more capital to the field. There's a higher excitement and degree of confidence that you can take this to the commercial plants that will help convince those that may have stayed on the sidelines and said, we're not going to invest at this right now. It's too, too risky or too uncertain. There's going to be a change in attitude on that. But it's also the emotional side, right? Once you have an existential proof of something, it changes emotionally how we how we interact with the challenge or whatever. I mean, I, I'm not superhuman. I mean, I, there are days where I would sort of listen and my wife would say, Michael, are, you know, you're working so hard. Are you chasing ghosts? And you add it for 25 years. I would say, no, 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 I'm not. But the reality is, of course, somewhere you think about it, well, gee, maybe this is a problem that's too hard for humanity. That's nice to have been removed. We now know it can be done, right? And I think as humans... When you look at successes of things like the moon race and us getting up, uh, you know, in the late 60s on, on the moon and safely back, these are the kind of events where once they've happened, it's an inflection point and there's a whole different layer of confidence and conviction. And it usually leads to more efficiency and better focus and the emotional boost you get just makes you work faster, better, quicker, more accurate. I don't know. It's all those things, right? And I think you will see that now. I, there's no question in my mind across whether it's funding or it's progress. And just like in the case of the four minute mile, you know, after Roger beat the time, very quickly, I think it was like a couple of weeks later, right? Suddenly another runner did and then another runner did. And I'm not saying in a few weeks we're going to do that, but over the next few years, you're going to see that. And I think that's probably the most enduring thing to take away out of that event, right? That yeah. while maybe this particular kind is hard to convert quickly to a power plant, there are others of us that have a way to do that more appropriately. And we are now going to be empowered by that event. The more funding will come. The government will be, I think, a lot more conducive to supporting it at higher rates. I'm sure the people in Congress have paid attention to that. And as a nation, I think we're excited now. Yeah, Those things are no longer now the question. The question is now how can we get there fast and you know contribute to what we need to do, which is, you know, get ourselves off fossil fuels and create this uh, world of abundance that is not conflicted with strife in the world of over energy resources, but, you know, how we bring them to everybody on the planet and, and improve qualities of life and access to things and so forth. Yeah, we need dreamers, we need explorers, but we also need builders and we also need followers. You know, we need them all. And when we think about the scale of the issue that we're trying to deal with in terms of provide good, clean, abundant energy for everyone on the planet. And the fact that the demand for electricity is going to double in the next, you know, 25, 30 years, we're going to need everybody. If you made it happen tomorrow, Michael, if we discovered something and next year we had net energy out, TAE couldn't meet the needs of this planet in terms of delivering fusion energy to every place that needs it, right? This is going to take an army. Oh God, yeah. Or not an army. It's going to take a movement. It's going to take all hands on deck, right? Oh, it's a, it's like they say, it, it takes a lot more than a village. It takes the planet. It's a global thing, right? I yeah. mean, and this is, you know, people always ask me now that the National Ignition Facility did this, does that bother you? And the answer is no, it doesn't. I mean, first as a human, <laughs> I want this solution. Yes. You know, I've been now spending my career on delivering and developing that or trying to do that anyway. And then you think the field is small, the challenge is massive. It's like, you know, we're all little Davids going against this insane Goliath of nature, this challenge. So everybody that contributes something that gets us a step closer is not just a hero, but a role model and somebody you aspire to and cheer on. And if more than one of us succeeds, to your point of the skill of what's coming at us, we need all of it, right? I mean, think about what's at stake, right? So you know, I always look at this from sort of historical perspective and the statistics of the data we need to about double our electric generation capacity on the planet over the next 20 years or so. So by mid-century, roughly, we need to be a double the available power production capability globally. 
Now, where we are today is already incredible, but think how long that took. That goes all the way back to the first steam engines, right? In the Industrial Revolution. That's taken us, what is a fair number? I don't know, 150 years or so. But we, you can pick the different definition where you start counting, but it's a long time. Now we want to replicate that and compress that into like two decades. And by the way, not using combustible materials. We want to do it clean and in a very environmentally benign way. The burden is enormous and the skill is enormous. It is enormous. But the thing that gives me hope, you know, because I was musing on the fact that 75 years ago this week, and I think it's actually tomorrow, was the first successful test of the transistor, mm -hmm. right? Was it Shockley, I think? Shockley, right? Good point. Yep, absolutely. It's Bell Labs, yeah. And then, you know, part of his cohort was Moore, you know, that, that created Intel. And, mm -hmm. you know, this was the birth of Silicon Valley. And look where we are today. I mean, it's been 75 years of taking transistors and miniaturizing them and putting millions and millions and millions of them into this microphone or into your phone or this computer. And part of me gets a little discouraged. I think, wow, that took a really long time to get to where we are today. But then I remind myself that what we have available to us just in the past 10 years is radically different than what we had when we started TAE. You have high computational computing, I mean, really super powerful computing, much more than we had even 10 years ago. We've got additive manufacturing, so we could 3D print and test and iterate on components within the walls of TAE in weeks as opposed to, you know, months. You have machine learning and artificial intelligence, which has definitely moved the needle a great deal. The defining moment and why fusion now and why this the always standing joke around the field, right? It's decades before and it'll always be decades. Why it's changing is really, it's multiple things. One is, of course, we've gotten smarter about how that works and we understand it better. And our first contributors back Norman's generation and before, I mean, they have, they've laid the foundation. These are giants on whose shoulders we stand on. But now when you look what we have, what these guys didn't have, we've got tools that can deliver pressuring stuff with magnets, using intense lasers, using particle accelerators didn't exist. You mentioned all these other technologies from machine learning to the fabrication techniques and stuff. All these things are now here. Some developed, like we did some of these innovations in our own history now. Some came by serendipity in parallel evolutions elsewhere. But the important part is they're here now. And there's a confluence of technology and tools with knowledge and wisdom. And it's very exciting that that's happening right now. And so I think in the next five to 10 years, I think we'll see some pretty explosive movement forward in the fast pace in the direction to get to these plants. I think we're in an accelerated stage of delivery. And I think everybody senses that that's around the field. I mean, the people like us that work in it, I mean, I, if I look back on my early career, and, you know, where we are now, it's not just the receptivity of our idea by others. The entire field is lifted up. You know, and it wasn't just an, the event on the National Ignition Facility in the last couple of weeks now, but it's, there were other precursors like that. We announced last year some of the work we've done in machine learning with Google, right, which completely resets the timescale on which you can actively control plasma and manipulate things. I think people in Switzerland working together with the British outfit on machine learning did similar things in Tokamax now. There's a capability now on feedback and adjustments that can happen on less than a blink of an eye, right? Those things are there. You had last year um, JET, the European Taurus, show that they could hold plasma at very high performance levels together for quite a good long time and make megawatts of power in the process. And you had one of our private competitors, well, our compatriots, I should rather say, the Commonwealth Fusion, they showed these higher temperature superconducting magnets that could make a big impact on compactifying fusion machines. So there's all that, and then you, additive manufacturing, all this stuff. So yeah, it's an incredibly exciting time. And if I think through my entire career, had we had that 20 years ago, we would probably be further. And, you know, but uh, it's good that it happens now. And I'm still, you know, young enough and energetic enough to go flog at it for another decade plus. So another decade. And at that point, hopefully have a power plant. You can cut the ribbon on a commercial power plant. There you go. Hey, Michael, one last question. Have you talked to your kids about what happened at the ignition facility and what it means to your life work? I, we did. We did. I mean, in fact, uh, you know, my wife is a big nerd on these things. She videotaped those TV interviews and stuff. And then, you know, kids came home from school and she said, look, dad's on TV. And and he said, do you know why he's on TV? And then they start asking, right? And so we start talking about it. And my son, he's 12 and he's very, very precocious. We had him in his class out a few years ago. We brought the entire fourth grade up 
to our facility and we threw a day of physics experiments and stuff. And when they got back, the echo from the teachers and the people at the school was, this was the coolest field trip that they took in their entire years, this is, you know, five years in elementary school there. And the kids were really, really energized. That shows you, you know, and so they naturally start getting interested. And today, if they, people ask, you know, what's your dad doing? He's, he says, uh, he's, he's trying to save the world in a way. It's over dramatic, perhaps, but, you know, it, it, the kernel is there. So, no, they do understand. They did ask and I explained and I said, you know, this isn't something we did at TAE, but this in a, in a way is a bootstrapping event for us too. And then I said, then stepping away from what egotistically your dad does or whatever, but from a perspective of humanity, right? That is an awesome event that should all of us feel really cheery about and moves us forward. And I think certainly the kids understand that and they were very excited. And you know, if you ask them today what some of the problems are, they're also much more educated than we were when we were growing up. I mean, to be honest, I feel pressure from my kids. Now, my son has put me to task and say, why is it taking so long? Yeah. He's asked me this for the past couple of years. How come you don't have a power plant yet? I said, honey, it's super hard to do. You know, this isn't easy. But we talk about that actually quite a bit. And I find that fascinating that they, that a generation, first of all, I think they're already much more aware of the impact on climate and other things, right? Yeah. They learn it now in school. I mean, you know, it's amazing. We go out, we go hiking and there's a little piece of trash or something and my son picks it up and I say, you need to be a little careful because you don't know who, who held that and you know what's on it potentially. But he says, well, no, 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 we have to. We, if, if we leave that, we're going to trash this place. We have to be stewards. It's remarkable. You know, this was years ago when he was probably seven, eight years old saying that. And so they will take us to task, I tell you. And I think one of the things that to me is important um, to make me feel good, it's a stewardship thing, right? We're all here to contribute and hopefully make this place, place a better place. It doesn't matter who you are and what your political beliefs are, right? This is impactful from whatever perspective you look at it. Yes, you'll have, obviously, for those who care about the environment, the ability to make that a better place. For those who care about energy availability on a more egalitarian basis, between the half and half knots today, there's huge gradients, right? We can fix those. For those who are national security and sort of hogs on those side, they will find that this is a way to secure energy for each country independently in a way. And for those who want peace, uh, that will bring peace then because then we'll have less rivalry over the scarcity of these resources. So I think, yeah, it, you know, it, it, there's no question about it. And when you look at individual level, it brings prosperity, it brings health. Healthcare is expensive, but also energy intense. And in many parts of the world, there's enough energy to even have a foundation to build good healthcare on top of it, right? So energy impacts just every facet of our lives more than anything I can think of. And then derivative of that, all the other benefits that come. So yeah, absolutely agree with you. It's a huge impact economically, policy-wise, the fundamental behaviors of why we um, go to conflict with people is going to get very changed and perhaps hopefully goes away. Well... Michael, I, for one, want to thank you for your tireless dedication to this mission and your commitment to building this vision for TAE and realizing fusion. And I'm going to say this with great emphasis in our lifetime, because I think that's what's going to happen. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your time on Good Clean Energy. Thank you. I much appreciate uh, being here chatting. This was a really, really fun conversation. Can you believe what just happened? We just made fusion happen on Earth. That's pretty cool. Thanks for listening to Good Clean Energy.